I would like to thank those of you that chose to spend your time here with me today at this corporate forum sponsored by the Keystone Dental Group. I am Dr. Michael Klein, a clinically practicing prosthodontist, as well as wearing another hat as the CTO or Chief Technology Officer of the Keystone Dental Group. My talk today will be about changing the way you think about digital technology and procedures, when, what, and how to create a useful digital workflow, or what I'll call the real digital revolution. So staying within the parameters or themes uh, of this meeting beyond the boundaries, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, how to take a digital impression, and I'm not going to talk about making a surgical guide, but what I'm going to talk about is understanding the possibilities of digital technology, new technology, new materials, new techniques, better outcomes, fewer treatment visits, less treatment time per visit, lower costs. Some of the things we'll talk about will be 3D printing during surgery for simplified restorative treatment. Use of the immediate zirconia provisional restoration. So inserting at the time of extractions and implant placement, a zirconia based restoration as opposed to an acrylic or PMMA restoration. The in-office dental laboratory. Well, a laboratory that every prosthodontist for sure should have, and probably all restorative doctors today, and it's being made possible by things like what I will call the virtual technician. So we'll talk about the virtual technician also. I'll introduce you to some new techniques, such as a screw access hole recovery guide technique, as well as using low dose cone beam CT to create simplified provisional restorations. We'll discuss simplifying workflows for straightforward treatment, such as final impression taking at the uncovering visit to really streamline your restorations, as well as small segment provisionalization, the use of custom healing abutments for simplified, improved emergence profile outcomes. But to do all of these things, you're going to need to open your mind and rethink the way you provide patient treatment, as well as rethink the way you sequence patient treatment. So we're going to talk about tools to record relevant information to properly create a treatment plan or data collection. We're gonna talk about tools to analyze the data to create a treatment plan. And you may have some of these tools, but maybe we'll talk about how to use them a little differently. We're gonna talk about tools used during surgery to simplify treatment, but, but not just surgical treatment, to simplify restorative treatment. And we're gonna talk about laboratory tools and techniques to simplify restorative treatment during surgery, as well as during uh, just standard, straightforward surgical, uh, surgical, excuse me, restorative procedures. So first, let's talk about the tools, and I broke them down to different categories. But let's talk about number one, technology. So I broke it down into must-haves and nice to have. So today, must-have, well, the intraoral surface scanner, scanner. And I'm sure many, if not all of you, already have some type of scanner. And, and I don't care if it's a, it's a three-shape Rios or if it's Airstream or if it's Medit or any number of an, any other scanners that, uh, uh, that you're proficient with. But the next thing that, that is a must-have today is a 3D printer. And today there are many 3D printers to go ahead and choose from. Um, this is what I have in my office. I have a sprint ray system and I come, this is already, uh, oh, I think maybe the third or fourth generation of, of printers that, uh, that we have. I started with Envision Tech and went to Stratus Object and went to uh, uh, Formlab. Um, and for the past oh, six to nine months, um, we're getting excellent results and very happy with our sprint ray system. And, you know, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and talk about it. And it's a little bit, and it's versatility and how we go about utilizing uh, 
you know, the printer. And we don't use it uh, sometimes. We use it multiple times every day. And this should be just a standard piece of equipment in every uh, uh, restorative doctor's office. And they simplified it so that uh, not only uh, is it easy to go ahead and print, but it's easy to complete the restoration in terms of cleaning and, and curing. And we'll talk about that also. Now, in the nice to have columns, um, I listed first the Cone Beam CT scanner. Um, what I have in my office is a, a Ray scan from Ray America. Uh, I actually have the Alpha Plus unit. Uh, and I call it nice to have, but you know, I'm not sure. You know, it's you know steadily moving in the into the must have column. Uh, and if you're placing implants, then it's for sure a must have, even if it's single teeth or simple, straightforward type of uh, of implant placement. Um, but even as you'll see, we're going to talk about some restorative techniques uh, and the impact that CT has on it, which is why I think it may start moving into that must have column. Um, nice to have, um, you know, before uh, I would have had the, my CNC milling machine in the, in the must have column. Here I moved it down to uh, my nice to have. And that's because uh, most of the things that I manufacture technologically, I do with 3D printing today. Um, today, the CNC machine uh, that we have, and I have an Amin Gerbach, Amin Gerbach, Gerbach uh, Motion 2 machine, um, is for manufacturing uh, custom abutments. And if I'm going to make any kind of final restorations out of zirconia or perhaps uh, glass, uh, glass ceramics. But anything that I'm making out of, uh, 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 of acrylic, uh, uh, such as uh, whether it's surgical guides or it's provisional restorations or models or anything like that, that's all being printed, printing today. Um, and then the, the last nice to have I have is, is facial scanning, uh, scanning technology. And that's, I think, we're at the beginning of understanding how to go ahead and, and utilize it. Software, must-haves. Well, surgical planning software. Well, certainly, if you're going ahead and placing implants, I think you should have it. Um, and even if you're just restoring implants, you should have it. And both of those, even if someone else is doing the planning, um, you should have that software for viewing. Um, and you should have it for viewing, you know, if you're doing surgery and someone else is doing the planning, even if you reviewed it, you want to be able to interactively look at it at the time of, of surgery. And if you're just the restorative doctor and you're not doing the surgery, well, today we know that there are uh, uh, better or ideal or positions that we want the implants to be in. We don't want to go ahead and design our restorations because of where the implants are, but there are many factors that we take into account. Um, such as uh, uh, what type of restoration we want, want screw retained or cementable. Um, do, where's the emergence profile going to go ahead and be? And do we want to control the vertical position of the implant relative to that? Uh, what type of abutment system are we using? What type of materials are we using? And is there, is there a, a consideration relative to the strength of the material in terms of the thickness of, uh, of the restoration? And do we need to create enough space you know, for that? And so there are many factors there that surgeon placing the implants may or may not be aware of or be thinking of, but as the restorative doctor, you're going to be left with, and therefore, you should have the ability to, to, to collaborate on these decisions. So nice to have, I'll call it interactive planning software and not just viewing software, um, prosthetic planning software for diagnostic wax up, for restoration design. But again, nice to have because you could, can do that if you're not doing the design work in conjunction with your laboratory or a planning service. And again, facial scanning uh, software, although we really need to learn what to go ahead and do with that. So today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of products or things that uh, uh, that are, are integrated within uh, the Keystone group. Um, and the first product here is the is what I'll call Key Plan. I'm not calling that's the name. It's powered by ExoCAD, and it looks and is very similar to ExoPlan. And what I like about this software is that it comes in two variations. And one is a viewing variation, but the viewing variation allows it to be interactive. So uh, you can have your laboratory or planners plan the implant positions, um, and then it gets sent to you, and you can manipulate the implants afterwards. So your viewer version of the software is fully interactive, so you can make slight adjustments and changes to the orientation, angulation, or position of the implants without doing the whole plan.
Uh, in terms of clinical tools, must-haves, well, again, if you're doing surgery, fully guided surgical kit. If you're, if you're uh, uh, collaborating with a surgeon who's going to do it, well, I think they also should have a fully guided surgical kit because we want to decide exactly where that implant's going to be uh, placed for all the reasons that we talked about, aesthetics, function, material strength, uh, uh, an evaluation of the parafunctional habits of the patient, uh, all of those things, and there's a right position for it. And you take the time to go ahead and plan that placement, and this way it's enforced properly in terms of doing it. Um, number two, well, you need to have intraoral scan abutments that are compatible with the implants or abutments being scanned and libraries in the design software being used. So you need to make sure that whatever design software there is, the proper and appropriate libraries are in there for those designs. Nice to have, well, I'll call an ISQ measurement tool, right? That's kind of like an, that's an OSTEL. Um, that's a tool for assessing uh, stability of implant, uh, implants within bone. See, I don't like to do anything subjectively that I can do objectively. And one of those is evaluating the integration of, uh, uh, of implants or where they are within that, within that point, in, point in time. And as opposed to going ahead and just, you know, looking at a, a, a radiograph um, and assessing what the implant to bone relationship is and the amount of time I've spent, I've got an objective tool that will give me a, me a number and I can look at, uh, at uh, absolute numbers, but I can look at trends and numbers to make assessments. Is it the appropriate time to restore the implant or what's going on with that implant? Do I have a problem implant? Now, when it comes to go and, and purchasing or talking about any of the equipment and things that we're talking about, right, uh, cone beam CT scanners and intraoral scanners and different softwares uh, and 3D printers and CC machines, uh, people you talk to, the salesman will all talk about open architecture, open architecture. And pretty much everyone's going to say they have open architecture, and they probably do in some format. It may be more or less complex to go ahead and have that open architecture and utilize it, um, as well as it may be more or less costly. There might be fees or additional modules associated with being able to do that. So what does that really mean, open architecture? Um, so here is my definition for it. Um, data that's collected from diagnostic hardware. What's diagnostic hardware? Cone beam CT, intraoral scanners, can be accepted into the CAD software. What's the CAD software? That's the planning and design software. That's a three-shape design software. That's ExoCAD. That's Implant Studio. That's ExoPlan. That's KeyPlan, which will produce, those softwares will produce a manufacturing file, an STL, that will be accepted and read by the CAM technology. What's the CAM technology? That's the manufacturing technology, which is the 3D printer or the CNC milling machine. Or in other words, does everything speak to each other or easily speak to each other? So I'm going to uh, present to you here the, the Keystone Digital Ecosystem. Or these are the different products, uh, uh, hardwares, softwares, parts, and pieces that are used to go ahead and, and manage our patients digitally from a digital you know, orientation. And that's how we collect data, how we uh, use our software to design, uh, whether we're using someone else to go ahead and do designing for us, um, our technology such as 3D printing, libraries of implants, of components and parts, our guided systems to position and place our implants, as well as our digital components, which are scan button bodies, abutments, uh, dim analogs, milling blanks, all that come together so that you can have a final restoration made. And so within the, the Keystone ecosystem, I told you, you know, listen, we have a concept of open architecture. So everything here that we have has an open architecture, but we've created innovations and collaborations, right? So that there'll be smooth integration within this architecture. So for example, in terms of data collection, when we talk about cone, cone beam CT scanners, well, pretty much every cone, cone beam CT will integrate within their data. We have a collaboration with Ray America because, uh, and you'll see some of their products and some of the things that we can do and, and, and why we, we selected to collaborate with them. We have a collaboration with ExoCAD where we have key plan software, which is the Keystone version of, uh, of ExoPlan with all the appropriate uh, uh, libraries and design capabilities. Uh, we have collaboration with 
planning and design services because most of us you know aren't going to do the design work we don't want to go and do our own virtual wax ups we don't want to go ahead and plan our own implant placements of course we need to evaluate it we need to critique it we need to adjust it but the heavy lifting of the work we want someone else to do and that could be your library your laboratory that you currently work with probably the best choice but if not their design services and we have collaborations with full contour as well as sprint rate cloud design uh, services uh, in terms of manufacturing technology right our collaboration is with sprint ray and that's a th 3d printing it's specifically designed for the dental environment um, and that's relative to their materials and all the things they can produce whether it's surgical guides or provisionals or uh, even final restorations as well as models we have all the correct libraries Li what are libraries those are the geometries of the implants those are the geometries of the components uh, whether it's the tie bases, it's the multi-units, it's the analogs that are imported into the softwares. We have fully guided systems for our, our major implant lines, all PAL top brands, Genesis implant systems, Prima Plus implant systems, and digitally compliant components. Again, the scan abutments, the dim analogs, the tie bases, the multi-units, the milling blanks for our systems, all contributing to being able to produce the final restoration that you, that you want. So let's get right down to some some patients, how all this works uh, clinically, because you know, that's how I learn. Um, I learn uh, I go, I'm a visual learner, I guess. I want to see what someone else is doing with the with with this stuff and how they make it work. So you can give me a workflow. but Let me see it in a patient's mouth. So here we have a, a young lady who uh, um, isn't taking the best care of her teeth. Very nice patient. OK, she's wearing a full maxillary denture and she has a failing mandibular dentition. And we're gonna restore her entire mouth with uh, implant-based restorations. We're first going to address her mandible. So our first step is we collect data, and what are our two major data points? We're going to take intraoral scans, right, that are properly, properly mounted at her, her centric relation and vertical dimension. Our comb beam CT, we integrate the data sets, a virtual wax up is done, and implant planning is done. And the plan is going to be to extract all her mandibular teeth, place implants, they're going to be angled implants posteriorly, and we're going to immediately provisionalize those mandibular implants. Now, when we talked about digitally, we have the opportunity to, to provide the best and easiest treatment for our patient. And so there's going to be an impact of how we sequence the treatment that we, that we do. So if we were to go and extract all of these teeth and go to place these implants, and we're doing this ideally in a guided type of approach, what's happening with the surgical guide? It's sitting on the soft tissue and I've got to you know, pin it to place, which automatically incorporates within it the potential for some error. I know that if I want to have the most accurate surgical guide, I want it to sit on something fixed. What do we have fixed inside this patient's mouth? We have the patient's teeth. So I wanna go ahead and utilize the patient's teeth to fix the surgical guide into position because it will give me predictable implant positioning. It'll make the surgical procedure much easier and it will then make the restorative procedure also easier because of all those reasons. So we plan our implant, uh, our implant positions. And, and when I plan my implant position, uh, I want to plan my implant position where I want it to be for, right, for maximum longevity, right, to support my final restoration. I don't want to pick places to put my implants so that I could keep a tooth, right, uh, or use something provisionally, you know, for, uh, you know, a temporary, a temporary basis. So here's the plan to go ahead and position in place and place the, uh, the implants. And we can see that, uh, that uh, I've extracted all but three all but three of the patient's mandibular teeth or virtually extracted those teeth. And there you see the implant positions that are going to be placed. So we're going to retain those three teeth and it will secure the surgical guide this time. And if we take a look at the positions of, uh, of those of two of these implants, you see, well, they're right on top of those teeth. How are those guide sleeves? Take a look at that bottom picture. You know, look, the guide sleeve is, is running into that adjacent tooth. It's not even gonna, gonna fit there you know, on, on top of that. And these have to fit simply. So part of the instructions always is, is what do I have to do to properly seat my surgical guide? So I've extracted all the teeth but three. 
Um, I selected those three because they're not going to really interfere with my implant position. Two of the teeth might interfere with my guide, but not with the implant position. So what do I do? I know those are the positions that are going to fear. So I, I have an instruction to cut those teeth. You know, and I can look, I can look at the picture, right? And I see where that guide is seating. So, you know, I don't have to try and fit that guide before I even try and seat that guide. I take my handpiece and I cut, uh, I cut the areas very rapidly and quickly so that the guide can easily seat. And I have enough contact with enough other areas that the guide's not going to be loose, uh, loose at all in those areas. So I seat the guide. We can take a look and see. You can even see through those windows where the teeth have been cut so it easily seats. The osteotomy is prepared and the implants are placed. Now, I haven't removed those teeth. I've kept those three teeth, even though, even though I've, I've finished positioning and placing the implants. See, I have another purpose for them. I'm going to see soon how they help me provisionally and streamline my provisional restoration. So I've placed multi-units and I've placed scan abutments on top of the multi-units and I'm going to now go and scan the restoration. So number one, it's going to be easier to scan when I have more fixed structures. So those teeth help me in the scanning, certainly bridging between the posterior implants to the anterior implants. And if you look at the bottom left picture, you'll also see that I've sutured, you know, quickly uh, in between the implants because those open flaps, it'll be more difficult to scan those areas and more easy to scan if we close those, close those areas. So I've scanned those, uh, those areas. Now I go and I send this scan to my laboratory, but I'm going to utilize those through, through those teeth because it's gonna allow me to integrate those implant position into a model that's already been created, okay? In anticipation of the implant placement, right? That's from my surgical plan that already has the final restoration designed. So the final, excuse me, the provisional restoration design. So the provisional restoration is already designed. All I need to know is what are the exact implant positions and link the two. So now we've scanned the, we've scanned the, uh, the abutments. I can cut the sutures, open the flaps, extract the remaining teeth, adjust the bone, graft the areas that need to be grafted. I leave the scan, uh, scan abutments in place. I use them like multi-unit healing abutments so I can suture around them. And I just leave them in place. Why take them off and waste the time putting on multi-unit healing abutments? Now, the laboratory, while all that's been going on, while we've been extracting and debriding and grafting and suturing, they've been going ahead and designing and designing and finishing the provisional restoration. So they've taken the scan with the on the multi-units with the scan flags, integrated it, okay, with a previous model, which they can do because I've kept those three teeth. So when I kept those three teeth, it wasn't just for convenience of securing the surgical guide. Of course, that was important, but it's also so that I can integrate the two models together. And once I can integrate the two models together, right, I can utilize the design that's already been made. And I already have from that, right, I maintain the central correlation, vertical tension that was recorded previously while the teeth were still in the patient's mouth. And I'm now be able to that utilize the, the pre-prepared prosthetic design. And I save an hour and a half or more of, of restorative uh, design. So now the software will, will allow these implant positions and scan flags to be imported into the previous model. And on that previous model, I already have the, the wax up or the design for the provisional restoration. And now it turns into a 20 or so minute process just to go and finesse the area between the actual implant position and what was originally designed from this. So I've taken that would have taken two hours and we turned it into 20 minutes. Now, in the laboratory, and here's my laboratory, you see I, I had uh, my milling machine, I've got my printers, um, I got my computers for designing things. That's the whole laboratory. Okay, so here's my printer. This is the Sprint Ray printer. Uh, with this printer, I have two settings. I can print at uh, 55 microns or 100 microns. I'm usually going to print at 100 microns for these provisional restorations. It will take half the time. This provisional restoration will take approximately 35 minutes. That's right, 35 minutes to print. 
And if you take a look at the picture on the right, you'll see I have two trays. And one's got like that uh, purplish bluish liquid in it, and the other one's got the you know more tooth colored liquid in it. So one's got temporary material in it, and the other one's got surgical guide material. When I put that picture there, I have different models, I have different provisionals, I have different shades for provisionals, I prevent surgical guides. And I don't need to pour in goop and then clean out the goop and then you know waste material, waste time, have all that mess. Oh, I just have different trays. And I have those covers. You see they're leaning up against the other machines there. Um, I just have each tray prepared already with the material in it. Um, and I put in the tray for whatever I'm manufacturing. And the other ones get closed up and put in the draw. So it's easy to swap in. There's also a really nice interface on this machine that tells exactly what's going on you know, as, it's, uh, as it's going on. Then we have our cleaning units and curing units. And this makes it easier to go ahead and, and clean and cure while uh, – uh, we're doing this because I don't want to do this and my partners want to do this. I want my staff to do it. And I talked about using a virtual technician, which means I don't need to have a technician in my office. I can have, I can take a, a, a dental assistant um, and, uh, and they can be very rapidly trained to go ahead and do all of the, all of this. So there you see the, the provisional is out of the, the goop, I'll call it. And you see there are two of them and they look exactly the same because there are two. I always make two. Why? The material cost is nothing for this. It's pennies. Go ahead and manufacture this. And so I have two. Well, what happens if one breaks, let's say, while we're doing something? I've already got it made. But that's unlikely to happen. You know what? Maybe in a week or two weeks or two months or three months or six months of provisional breaks, I don't have to repair provisionals anymore. I just pulled the second one out of the drawer. You know, in a case like this, I would cement and tie bases and we're off to, you know, we're good to go. You know, I don't spend time anymore repairing provisionals. And they get thrown into the into the cleaning machine and it, it does all the cleaning for us. So here's how it works. OK, here's uh, here's my partner, uh, uh, Dr. Alon Waltuck. Um, a lot of the uh, the workflows and things that we're doing, you know, he's actually evolved and developed. We work as a great team, uh, great team, uh, you know, together. And he's a young guy. So he's really digitally fluid. He understands files and what they mean and how to manipulate and integrate things. And that's the key to us developing workflows that are useful, right, and help us in in our jobs. So he's removed the uh, he's removed the printed uh, prosthesis. He's just putting it in the well of the, the sprint ray machine. You close the door, press the button, and it's cleaning. You know, and how does it clean? It's got uh, it's got uh, two wells of alcohol. One's clean and one's dirty. So now you see it's sucking out the alcohol uh, on let's call it the dirtier side, and it's going to now spray it inside. Okay, there you see it kind of bubbling, spraying, and it's cleaning, you know, any excess residue that's uh, of the printing of the printing material. Okay, once that's done, what happens is, is it sucks out the dirty alcohol and it injects in clean the clean alcohol. So it's a two-phase process. And there you see it bubbling around. Once it finishes bubbling and cleaning, right, it dries and you take it out, and that's what it looks like when it, it comes out. If you want to shorten the, the the whole process, I think the whole thing of cleaning is 14 minutes or so. Um, you can skip the drying process. You can uh, you could air dry it also, you know, from that. It's got a really again nice interface. You see exactly how many minutes what's going on, which cycle it's in. Is it cycle one washing, cycle two washing, or is it or is it drying? So you know you where you are in the process. And we take it, we put it into the into the uh, into the curing oven. Again, nice interface tells you exactly what's going on. A whole complete uh, system that makes it simpler. So, um, if you want to go ahead and uh, and be a little more sophisticated and add on uh, a gingival mask, so here we've got paintable resin. Uh, again, really simple and easy to go ahead and use. An assistant can do it if you don't want to have a technician inside the office. This takes, again, a couple of minutes to go ahead and paint on. You throw it back in the curing oven, and it cures very quickly. Now, I show you this picture because I'm showing you a, a mill device versus printed. And in the in the mill devices, the way we used to would have uh, done it, that we would have taken that, um, we created it from uh, our pre-surgical plan, and then we would have, in the patient's mount, looted everything together as opposed to printing it. Take a look uh, at, uh, you know, how much more structural integrity, and how much nicer the the printed uh, restoration is going to be. We then cement this in. We've tried all different types of resins and cements. Uh, we just powder liquid on acrylic around the uh, around the tie base and insert the tie base 
inside the provisional restoration. Um, that's been the, our most effective way of cementing in tie bases into printed as well as milled, you know, uh, uh, restorations. And that's what the restoration looks like finished from start to finish. Okay, from when we send the from when we send the scan till it's inserted inside the patient's mouth, uh, it's approximately ninety minutes. But it's not ninety minutes of working in the patient's mouth. Okay, it's a few minutes of working in the patient's mouth. We take the scan that takes what two, three minutes, um, and then we insert the provisional restoration. That's it. We probably spent five minutes in the patient's mouth, tops, you know, seven to ten minutes in the patient's mouth. The rest is done, you know, outside. Um, and so all the suturing, all the grafting, um, and at least no patient manipulation is during the rest of that. The rest of that time. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, our next young lady, failing maxillary dentition. I'm going to talk about some differences and some different techniques. So here we've got failing maxillary teeth. Okay, step number one, we take our, our uh, intraoral surface scan data. We do our diagnostic wax up. We create the, uh, we, we, we correct the incisal plane. We add, uh, we add teeth, all the things we need to do in a diagnostic wax up. We then integrate that with our surgical plan and create our surgical guide. Now, for this patient, we're going to have angled implants posteriorly also. And so we've got two surgical guides. One surgical guide for the angled implants posteriorly, we're retaining the maxillary anterior teeth because I have, again, a fixed surgical guide on a fixed structure of those teeth. And so for something that's got more acute uh, positioning, I wanted to do that. Then we'll go and extract the anterior teeth and we have our second surgical guide to position the anterior implants. So in terms of sequencing the guide for stabilization, remember, I left those anterior teeth, I positioned the posterior implants, and I have a second guide where I extract those teeth, okay, and I place the, place the, uh, the additional implants with a, with a second guide, uh, you know, for that. Again, these implants here are, uh, are Paltop brand dynamic implants, which are, have been uh, very effective for me. They're moderately aggressive, and they give great initial implant stability for immediate provisionalization. Now, in terms of uh, abutments in the digital age, generally we're using multi-units, we're using tie bases directly to the implant interface, or we're using custom abutments. I like to make screw retained restorations, which puts me into multi units or tie bases directly to the to the implant uh, implant head. Um, I rarely need a custom abutment on, let's say, a new case because it's all being designed and planed and accurately carried out, so we can position the implant exactly where we want it. Um, but when I have multiple units, my choice is always going to be to place a multi unit, and that's because the vector of force that I'm placing on I think is much more favorable than if I have a tie base. A base that's engaging is great for a single tooth but if you have a tie base that's not engaging so there's minimal extension into the implant it has to be minimal extent extension or the the restoration is not going to see passively on multiple implants unless there's 100 percent parallelism which means when there are excursive or lateral forces placed on that restoration where's the force going to it's going to the screw of the restoration so why do i want that so i'd rather go ahead and use a multi-unit and when using at least straight multi-units also, I have no direct communication between the screw access to the head of the implant because it's a solid piece. So it's the uh, ideal, uh, ideal uh, restorative abutment option. Again, we talked about this before, before in terms of managing flaps for scanning. What do I want to do? I want to throw in some quick sutures while the scanning is going to be done because I'll get a much more effective scan and it's easier to scan because when I have those wide open areas, right, of those extraction sockets or where the flap's been open, it's always more difficult to scan and doesn't capture as well. So if I can put in a few quick sutures, it'll be faster, quicker, easier scanning, right? The second thing that I'll do for simplify scanning during these types of procedures is we take a scan before we even begin the procedure and remove the teeth, remove the section of the scan where the implants themselves are going to be, are going to be placed. On a maxilla, this works very effectively because we have fixed peritonized tissue and those rugae's to, to, let's call it interlock and, and uh, for uh, the system to recognize. So we take our scan, it is immediately sent to the laboratory. Uh, now, while the planning and design is being done in the laboratory, the grafting is done, okay, the suturing is done. And again, I leave the scan abutments and they act as multi unit healing abutment. Saves time. In the laboratory, they now go ahead and integrate the ultimate the implant position model with 
the original model that has the uh, pre-designed provisional restoration on it. So again, we save lots of time by going ahead and doing that. And you can see this is going to be more of a crown and bridge style restoration. It's printed again. This is about you know 35 minutes to go ahead and print in the sprint rate printer at the 100 micron setting. Um, I don't see any reason to go to the to lower you know 50 55 micron setting for this type of restoration. And the tie bases are then cemented in, in place in that powder liquid technique that uh, I just uh, I just show you. Again, this is about a 90 minute process from finishing the design, printing, cleaning, um, and cementing the tie bases. And so again, uh, even if you can go and do this in that amount of time um, by curing them in, in the patient's mouth, remember they've got to be done in sequence or in tandem with the grafting and suturing, and think about all that additional patient uh, manipulation. You know, inside the patient's mouth restoratively now, we're scanning and we're seeding the restoration to, uh, to completion. Wow. You know, what a difference in the way we, we practice dentistry. Just in general, ideal scanning conditions are a clean, dry field, fixed, non-movable tissue, okay, which is why it's difficult, okay, when scanning an edentulous mandible, if there's not a lot of keratinized tissue, um, and close implant or abutment proximity, okay? So when you have fixed structures closer together, it becomes easier to, easier to scan. Now let's move to exactly to the to the opposite end from let's say big full arch cases to small relatively simple cases and here's a patient who had uh, 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 actually multiple con uh, um, uh, teeth uh, primary retained teeth we can see there's a primary retained cuspid and lateral that are failing uh, we took our intraoral surface scans the diagnostic wax ups. We integrated them with our CT, and the decision is not enough room to go ahead and place two implants. One implant is going to go and be placed in the position of the cuspid, and it, it will retain a cuspid and cantilevered lateral, you know, uh, restoration. Um, and the patient's, you know, occlusal scheme and the amount of force they were applied to it seemed to be favorable for that. So on uh, the initial consultation, we take the CT scan, we take the intral surface scan, and then we have our devices made, our surgical guide, as well as our provisional restoration, which is going to be a provisional Maryland bridge that's made out of, of uh, acrylic. And uh, in this case, it's uh, printed, but we both mill them as well as, as print them in terms of, of design. Okay, and so there's our provisional design, and it's taken from, again, the design that we re-wax the case to make the determination for appropriate implant position. The patient comes in, we extract uh, uh, the tooth, not much of an extraction. We place the implant, we graft and manage the extraction socket to create an ovate pontic form, and then we bond in the provisional Maryland bridge. Okay, and the patient takes a look and says, hey, I'm pretty happy. Um, I'm not worrying about the shade right now, but now maybe I want to do something with my contralateral uh, primary retained lateral and, and cuspid tooth. And they may have enough root structure that that, that might be a restorative solution as opposed to a as opposed to a, a surgical solution in that area. But I actually put that case in there because I wanted to show you this patient. So here's a patient that is congenitally missing a lateral incisor. And wow, look at that space. It's tight. There's a provisional Maryland bridge bonded in place there. The space looks relatively narrow. We're always looking at this and analyzing restorative space. And we know we've got that. We can see it from the provisional as well as surgical space. So let's take a look at the surgical space. And look at that CT. Um, and look at the implant. That's the inner squiggly line. The outer line is the is the uh, uh giving us a guide of, uh, of additional space. The question is, where does the tooth really end, okay? You know, where's the PDL and the lamina dura? And am I gonna damage the adjacent tooth? Because if I do that, that, you know, uh, that was the whole reason for, for not doing some more conventional restorative treatment here, right? To try and be uh, 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 less traumatic and not cause damage to the adjacent teeth. But not only that, you know, take a look. You know, I'm drawing lines where I think the tooth comes to. There's like no space for that implant, right? And if I look closer at the at the PA, take a look. Can you see that that root of the cuspid is actually hooked into the space? Here, let me draw it for you, okay? So take a look. That's the space I have to work with. And this is the trajectory the implant's going to have to be placed. Wow, that's not so uh, simple. And, you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps this isn't an appropriate position for an implant. So today, in many of our CT scanners, we have an endo setting. 
and the endo setting gives us you know a much higher resolution to that area wow look what a difference from what i can see in this picture here i can see the lamina dura and periodontal ligament clearly um, let's take a look here page through the images and if i page through those images i can clearly see the periodontal ligament space which is what what's in violet here and if I page through the implant, positioning this implant, it's going to be a 3.25 millimeter diameter paltop dynamic implant. That's going to that, that tapers as it goes. And I can see, you know, three dimensionally all the way through to the apical end of the implant and relative to the hook on that on that tooth, what the proper position is and can this be done. And, and both of these scans were taken with, uh, with my CT scanners, you know, the, the uh, 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 Ray America scan. Um, the, uh, the, the endo setting is on my new, uh, alpha plus, you know, machine on there. Um, and, you know, a question is, is, okay, you know, what about radiation exposure to these patients and is it, you know, worthwhile? So take a look on this race, uh, race scan alpha plus, when I put it on the endo setting, right, it's coming out to about 72 plus micro sieverts, which is, you know, half, you know, to uh, a quarter of in a conventional cone beam CT. So actually, it's a lower dose. It only gives me a small segment, okay? It gives me like a sextant, but at a lower dose than at a than at a full CT in the Alpha Scan Plus. And by the way, take a look. If you look at some of the other machines on the endo settings, look how high they are. So, you know, make sure if you've got an endo setting that uh, you're coming out with a reason, reasonable, you know, radiation Exposure. So we can actually, for these cases, uh, let's call them a congenitally missing tooth uh, cases, uh, mandibular incisus case cases, uh, missing lateral cases, um, where they are small segments, we can actually have a lower, much lower dose uh, uh, of exposure from the utilizing the endo setting while going ahead and giving us higher resolution for that. And just if you want to see how we compare these micro sievert numbers, you know, to uh, to uh, things that we know about, right? Okay, you can see, uh, well, you know, how that radiation translates to other things that we know about. Um, whether you're just walking around outside, whether you're taking an airplane, regular X-rays, um, you know, taking a mammogram, uh, any and all of those types of, of things. And we see that uh, this type of radiation exposure is certainly tolerable when it's clinically appropriate. It's not just nah, to, you know, just you know. Uh, you know, willy-nilly go ahead and take CTs, but appropriately to go ahead and utilize it. So here we go. We remove the provisional lateral bridge. We seat the surgical guide, and we go to place our implant. Um, I will always go and take a, a, uh, a digital scan at the time of implant placement if we're going not going to be immediately provisionalizing the, the case. So at the time of uncovering, okay, I have a provisional restoration that's ready to be inserted, and I don't have to do work. You know, I don't want to do any work that I don't have to. And you can see that, you know, the implant position here is placed subcrestally, and that's by, you know, objective assessment or evidence-based measurement numbers in terms of creating the appropriate emergence profile. And we carve out an emergence profile, leaving the peaks of bone, so that predictably we have a nice restoration with the papilla. But let's see how we did. Let's examine it a little bit closer and take a look. Let's look at that apical end where we were concerned about things. Again, if I draw over the lamina dura of the adjacent teeth, right, we're exactly we need, where we need to be. Uh, not because of any great skill, because there was proper planning done. We had good diagnostic tools that showed us exactly what our parameters were. We had planning software that allowed it, that allowed that integrates with that that allows us to create an appropriate plan. And then we had tools that allow us to implement that that plan. So um, this is a patient that uh, was sent to me uh, that had had a failed implant case. Um, I know that uh, the concept of stackable guides uh, is a, uh, a, a technique that a lot of people uh, like to go ahead and use. And you know what? They're really good techniques. Again, they're program techniques for bone reduction, replant placement, for insertion of the of the provisional restorations to the appropriate air, uh, uh, sites. And I like them because they were programmed. But some of them are a little more aggressive than I then at least I like. And I want a simpler, you know, uh, less traumatic way of of doing things. And so, you know, even though we get good results, right, I said, you know, can I take that concept of programming things digitally and apply it to some more conventional treatment? So I still employ the sequential extraction strategy. Not every patient does extract all their teeth and put implants and immediately load them on the same day. And so I still believe there's a place for the sequential extraction strategy. But can I go ahead and can I streamline, can I take some of these digital techniques and streamline that whole, that whole procedure? 
So here's a patient with a, a failing maxilla. It doesn't look that way from this, this picture, but we'll, we'll see. So number one, all the maxillary teeth were going to be extracted. And if you look at the cross-sectional images, you can see there's minimal bone around many of those, many of those teeth. And the plan was to go ahead and place four implants uh, in between the areas of the sinuses and then to graft both sinuses. And at the same time, we were going to put in those implants and graft the, and graft the sinuses. And those three remaining teeth, uh, cuspid, contralateral cuspid, and lateral incisor were going to be used to retain the provisional bridge because I like to keep everybody in fixed treatment if I can. Of course, I don't want to uh, uh, inadvertently load implants unless that's the plan. So what can I do to streamline this, this type, of, type of treatment? And so here was my plan. Those are the three teeth. You see cuspid lateral and contralateral cuspid, right, that were going to be remained uh, or going to remain to support the provisional restoration. So step number one was I prepared those three teeth and took a digital impression and provisionalized them with a provisional that looked just like their teeth look today. I then took that scan, integrated it, with their CT scan and plan the implant positions. I then virtually extracted the teeth that were going to be extracted. So we're looking at a model of what I expected to see at surgery. My four implants placed and my three teeth that have been prepared remaining to support the provisional restoration. On that, I have the laboratory go and, and do the wax up or design of the provisional restoration. And the patient liked the way her crown and bridge was before, and so we just had it replicated to that same exact design. Now we see the provisional design, and you can see where the you know three abutment teeth are, and within the provisional, where uh, where the provisional is going to go ahead and sit. But here's my concern: take a look at those two teeth that are cantilevered. They're there because uh, when the patient smiles, I don't want a big uh, void there. I need to have uh, uh, some additional teeth. Know, for aesthetic uh, for aesthetic purposes. But in the past, when I did sequential extraction cases, I always had cast metal reinforcement. Now, I don't have cast metal reinforcement, right? I want to use today's materials, and I want to get this done quickly, and I want to get it done cost-effectively. Um, I don't want to take two weeks or three weeks to get back from the laboratory, and I don't want to cost things a thousand or more dollars to go and have that restoration made. Let's use today's materials. So I said, well, you know what? Why don't I make it out of something stronger? Let's go ahead and, and, and augment the design. And why not make it out of zirconia? Because you know, in conjunction with my laboratory, I have to have a partnership with them, okay? I can get this made at relatively low cost, okay? A lot less than I would normally pay for that previous cast metal reinforced provisional restoration. So they take the design and they manufacture it out of zirconia. Okay, but it's gotta fit. What if it doesn't? So, uh, you know, I, I like to have a little bit of a backup plan. I'm a little bit of a, you know, uh, uh, you know belt suspenders kind of person. And so it's easy because the same manufacturing file can make me a PMMA provisional in the same exact design as zirconia. So it costs me almost nothing extra to have a backup in case I need it, in case it doesn't fit. So let's take a look at our patient. Here we see her. Okay, you see our teeth are even moving. Now that's how, uh, how loose they are. And so number one, we opened up the, the sinuses to do sinus grafting with a, a pisiotome, okay? And the sinuses are grafted. This is before the anterior is, the anterior is even being addressed. This is just sequencing of treatment to maximize, uh, uh, let's call it uh, the local anesthesia, uh, you know, for the patient and, and treatment. Now the provisionals are removed from the teeth that were prepared. The teeth are, that are going to be extracted are removed. You can see how, how loose those uh, how loose those teeth are. And there we've got, you know, uh, what was planned, right? We have our three prepared teeth to support the provisional with our virtual extractions man managing exactly our real extractions. And there's our provisional design that will fit on those abutment teeth. I've now got in hand my two provisional restorations, one zirconia, one PMMA. I hold my breath. I take my provisional because I want to try it in now. Okay. You know, I've been waiting too long. I, I want to see if this is going to work. And I ins go to insert it and boom, it goes right to place. Okay. It goes right to place um, with the occlusion, uh, you know, fairly on the, on the money. So I know that I'm going to have, you know, my restorative treatment is really, is really done. So now we're ready to place our implants. 
Um, we have our surgical guide. It's designed to go ahead and fit on those same abutment teeth. Again, this is because of integrating of, uh, of, data, of data files. And again, we have, I, want, I don't want it to be on soft tissue. I want it to be on something fixed. We have our fully guided system. This is a, a, a contra angle based system that uh, I developed along with the engineers at, at uh, Paltop, now uh, Keystone Dental Group. It allows very rapid and very easy guided surgery. Uh, the drill spins independently of the sleeves. There's a window in what we call the DGS that uh, irrigates the drill, so it's cooling during the entire time. And then there are sequential drills that are utilized afterwards to go ahead and finalize the implant position. Even though I do cases guided, I always check my final implant position before I place my implants. There's always an opportunity to make a correction in case it's necessary. But here we like our implant position, and so we're ready to go and finish placement of the, of the implants, also in a guided fashion. Okay, now our surgical treatment is, is finished and we're ready to complete our restorative segment of the case. And that's simply by putting cement in the zirconia provisional and seating it to place. So restorative time for this is really the amount of time it takes for the, for the cement to cure. And so I spent an hour at the first visit, okay? I spent an hour at the first visit preparing the teeth and taking an impression of those teeth and provisionalizing them. And that's the total time of the, of the treatment. And so, you know, as we all know, with guided surgery, it's very predictable. We can very predictably, you know, uh, end up with a result as it's, as, it's been, uh, as it's been planned. So this is a total of three appointments. First appointment was data collection, which was CT and intraoral surface scan and photographs. Appointment number two, one hour preparing three teeth and provisionalizing three teeth and, uh, and taking uh, digital scans. And appointment number three, surgery and provisional insertion. Okay, there's no, no restorative portion of that segment of that case. Of that case. This is a technique that, uh, along with my partner, uh, Lon Woltok, uh, we wrote up and submitted and had accepted uh, by compendium for publication, and we expect it to be out, or we anticipate that it will be out before the end of the, of the summer. Now, this patient uh, showed up, uh, uh, and uh, in my office on a day I wasn't there, and my partner, uh, Dr. Waltuck saw her. Um, she wasn't in the schedule. Her bridge was loose and hanging. This patient had an implant treatment, oh, maybe 15 years before, not in our office. I don't know if I would have placed the implants in those positions, but you know, this is 15 years. This held up. Um, but now she came in with uh, fractured bridge, bridge work, fractured abutments, okay, fractured implants, um, and, uh, and she couldn't remain that way. And there's no time in the schedule. So Alone went and took everything apart. So what he could salvage, put on some scan abutments, and took an digital impression. It took about a half hour of time they had to squeeze out of the day. He took that data and he sent it off to the laboratory. And so here we'll bring in the concept of virtual technician, which is I think what we should be using every day. So the data is collected in the office and it's sent off to the laboratory. The laboratory can be the laboratory that you work with conventionally. The laboratory can be used a can be a planning service. Uh, like Full Contour or Sprint Ray or, or any one of the number of planning services that are out there. It could be a technician that you have in your office, okay? But it's sent there. The laboratory then goes, or the virtual technician designs the, the provisional restoration and creates manufacturing files or design files, and that's sent to the dental office. Not in a bag, right? It's sent via the internet. So, Half hour to disassemble and take an impression. It's sent to the to the laboratory. The laboratory spends oh two two and a half hours designing this. Send this back back to the office. And in the office we manufacture. So this is an older case. This was milled in my Amangiri thermal motion two. It takes about two and a half hours to mill. Today I wouldn't even think about that. Today we we would take our sprint ray printer and in thirty five minutes we would go and we would we would print this. Regardless, it was able to be done in the same day cement in the, elude in the titanium cylinders, and, and here's the workflow. You scan in the office, you design in the laboratory, manufacturing is done in the office, and the insert is done in, back in the, in the dental office.
And that way the patient came in the morning where there was no time, we created a half hour of time to take the, collect the data. And then she came back at the end of the day and we just inserted the final restoration. Not a beautiful restoration at all, but she can function with it, right? She has something to walk out the door with. And now, you know, we can carefully collect all the data we need and create a plan. What do we need to do to re-restore her, her maxilla? Of course, we have we all know about custom, you know, healing abutments, but I think they're way underutilized um, because they can be used for, you know, a lot of surgical corrections, um, because I think there's a lot more correction of emergence profile should be done. That's that's been done. Um, it's not just for aesthetic areas, but it's also for posterior teeth. Why? Because, uh, you know, the concavities that are, are formed because of resorption of bone and then the following, you know, the, the flattening of that uh, soft tissue causes a site for food to collect and food impaction. And so it's really simple to go ahead and, and, and manage this. So at the time the implant is placed or at the time the implant is uncovered, right, if you just put on a custom healing abutment with a shape that you want to properly support, okay, the soft tissue or where the emergence profile will be for the final restoration, you've now corrected uh, the whole emergence profile of the soft tissue and you've prevented a, a food collection site. But as the restorative doctor, you've got to think about this. Um, certain might not be thinking about this. And this is why, you know, as, as pros, especially as prosthodontists, we need to be actively involved in the surgical planning to think about things and design things. And our surgical colleagues may not. They're experts in surgery. We need to be the experts in, uh, in, in understanding the implications of and what we can do to correct these types of these types of conditions, you know, and, and problems. We can come up with all kinds of innovative provisional, you know, restoration designs. Um, and it's, again, it's really simple and easy today. Today here we see milled ones, but, you know, today we can extract teeth, take digital impressions, have our virtual technician create a quick design for us, and then print right then and there, you know, and, and insert these provisional restorations. Or if not on the same day, then it can be, you know, for, uh, for another day. Uh, and again, we can come up with all types of designs um, and we can use them in ways we, we haven't done or haven't done effectively or it's been difficult and time consuming to do, whether it's, you know, management, not just aesthetically of teeth, but, you know, management of, of the you know, soft tissue architecture and, and profiles. So, you know, take a look here. Here's a patient where we extracted a tooth and implant, one implant was placed. A different implant was uncovered, right? An ovate pontic site was, you know, formed, um, and all of it's designed into the same provisional, provisional restoration that's going to be partially retained by a uh, by an implant to ovate pontic sites um, and bonded onto, you know, adjacent uh, adjacent teeth. So let me just show you something, you know, everyday streamlined workflow, how it impacts everything we do every day. Here's a case. Failing maxillary bridge. The bridge is going to be sectioned by the between the first and second molar. At the at the tooth with the decay polarity is going to be extracted. So we integrate our data sets: comb beam C, internal surface scan, surgical guide is created, implants placed, and you see there's going to be some grafting that's done. And the decision is to bury those implants. Now the implants are are healed. They're ready to be you know uncovered. But I want to get treatment done quick. The patient doesn't want to come for any more appointments. And I don't want them spending any more time in my office than they have to. I like my patients, but I like them to be happy, um, and I like to do treatment quickly when we can. So why not use surgical guide used to place the implants to guide the trephine to uncover the implants? Now, we can only do that if there's an adequate zone of keratinized tissue, and we don't need to manipulate the soft tissue, right, to fill out a concavity or manage the emergence profile. But here, here we clearly don't. And we could relatively atraumatically cut the soft tissue right over the heads of the implants. You can't even see them because bone's grown over them, right? And then we can remove that bone, right? So that we can move right onto the next step because we're not going to have much marginal change because the procedure is relatively atraumatic. So the multi-units can be placed. I told you, if I'm splinting any implants, I'm, um, I'm going to make a screw retain restoration with multi-units. I select my uh, multi-units, same visit, right? Okay, insert the multi-units. Same visit, take my final impression, okay, final impression. Now that data goes to the laboratory and they design the final restoration. But when they design the final restoration, I always go and take the manufacturing file and either mill or print a, uh, that restoration to try it in. 
So we take the SDL, and here it's in PMMA mil, older case, right? And then we go and I try it in. I said appointment number two. So appointment number two is a verification of passively seating restoration, contacts, emergence profile, occlusion, embrasure spaces. I test everything out. I don't want this going back. I don't want to be taking pickup impressions. I don't want to do any of the things that I go ahead and used to do, okay? Used to do. If something doesn't fit, I have to take a new impression. Some there was some other problem that was here. So I called this appointment number two. But with everything I just showed you, if I have the patient wait, you know, in this case, probably say, uh, 30 to 45 minutes because it's going to be quick to print it, very quick to print this and finish this. I can try it in on appointment number one. Okay, I can even cut out more appointment. And then once I verify this is what I want, now the laboratory will go ahead and and replicate it in zirconia. Right. So so it's a three appointment or today in my office would probably be a two appointment technique. The implants are uncovered atraumatically. Problems are placed, impressions are taken, trying is done. Again, this is in a simple, straightforward restoration. And then the second or third appointment, you insert the final restoration. And every patient, every restoration, single teeth, molars, I don't care, aesthetic or unesthetic, has a try-in, right, to evaluate all the factors we talk about. Emergence profile, occlusion, contours, gingival embrasure spaces, you know, aesthetics, everything. Now I'm going to go ahead and introduce you a, a uh, uh, and I apologize if other people thought about doing this, but what I would call a screw access hole recovery guide. This is a failing implant case. It was a case that was made by a local restorative doctor, and actually relatively elegantly, you know, maybe you know, 10 years or so before. But the case is failing, but not the healthiest patient, failing a uh, failing case. Take a look at these implants, right? So you can see the posterior implants, you know, seem to be okay but the anterior implants are all failing, no bone around them, right? All of them's, all of them got to go. Here's the restoration that's sitting on top of those implants. It's 20 millimeters, right? From the occlusal table to the, to the, to the, uh, to the implant heads. Um, let me describe to you the design of the restoration. Um, there are custom abutments and a large zirconia superstructure that is 20 millimeters tall cemented on top of that. How am I going to get this off? How much time do I have to spend cutting this restoration off and then making a provisional to go back on, onto it while all the treatments can be done? Implants removed, bone grafting done, additional implants, additional implants placed. So my partner, along wall talk, said, you know, I have an idea. Let's create a model uh, of exact or recreate the implant positions. So let's take a, a CT. So we take our cone beam CT. We can see the implants in the cone beam CT. And then we take our simulation software, right? And we reposition implants of the same dimension exactly three-dimensionally overlying those implant positions. Now we take our intraoral surface scan and we merge the two data sets. I remove the CT, okay? I remove the CT, and what do I have? I have the intro restoration sitting on top of the implants exactly where they are, okay? There you can see the implants. Now I put on extensions in the software, and I can see exactly where the implants are, or more importantly, where the screws or the screw access would be. You know exactly where to go fishing for the screws. I don't have to cut this all apart. I want to use this as a provisional restoration while the treatment's being done. And so we, on this, uh, because we have the positions of those implants, we can make a guide. It's like a surgical guide, exactly what it is. And so we use our surgical guide software to create a, a guide that will direct me directly to the overall location and angle and orientation of where I'm going to find screw access those custom abutments, okay? So here's my design based upon overlying implants on top of their existing implants. And we print out a surgical guide that will fit directly on top of the restoration. Now, just in case it didn't go well, okay, because these are new techniques for us. Again, I told you, belt and suspenders kind of guy. We also print a provisional restoration if we have to use it. There you see the, the restoration that was made. Again, this is 10 plus years ago. You can see the exposed threads of the failing implants.
I seek the surgical uh, guide or the screw access locator guide, right? And there are the exposed areas uh, of zirconia. And then I cut screw access holes to the head of the, of the implants. It's still a time consuming procedure, but look what I'm able to do. I'm able to remove in one piece without destroying the restoration, this 20 millimeter thick zirconia restoration. And you can see those aren't tied bases. Those are the seeing uh, out the, uh, the base of this. Those are custom abutments that this was all you know cemented to. Here I cut off these two anterior implants and remove them. But take a look, I have a perfectly serviceable provisional restoration that I can remove, I can have implants removed, I can have bone grafting done, I can have implants placed, and I use this as my screw retain provisional restoration for that patient. And so I have one last case, and I know I've gone way over my time, but I hope it's been worthwhile for you. And this is the patient where you see they're wearing a full maxillary denture, edentulous in the maxilla, um, and almost edentulous in the mandible, they have two remaining premolar teeth. And take a look at the at the at the uh, you know significant class three relationship between the mandible and maxilla, and we're going to move towards correcting that. Let's call it uh, artificially. Um, and so we place our maxillary implants in a guided technique. We place our mandibular implants in a guided technique. Also, paltop dynamic implants. The mandible is going to be immediately loaded. There are uh, uh, multi units placed. Um, and a provisional rest restoration that was pre-prepared and it's relined directly on that site, still in this class three relationship, just like they had in their, in their previous restoration. Now the maxilla is healed, the implants were buried. And so what we're going to use is we can use low dose radiation to create a virtual model of implant position provis for provisional restoration design. Well, how are we going to go ahead and do that? So we take a low dose CT scan. And there we're looking at 38 microsieverts for my machine, the Ray Scan Alpha Plus, um, which is a fraction of the conventional. It's, it's half of what I showed you in the endo dose. And the endo dose was half or less than the conventional dose. It was very low dose. And what we do is just what I showed you, what we had tried in the previous case. And that's I superimpose implants on top of the uh, implant simulations on top of the implants. And we can do this very accurately three-dimensionally in all orientations. And from this, we go and we create a virtual model of implant placement. We take our and create a, take our diagnostic wax up, integrate the two by overlying on top of the CT scan appliance she was wearing with a dual that was scans were taken with a dual scan technique, and we complete a provisional restoration design. So there's our provisional restoration, and that's been printed. Now we go to uncover the implants, place our multi units. Place our temporary cylinders with uh, with uh, aprons um, that uh, I also get from Keystone, and we inject uh, uh, light cured flowable resin, and then we can just seat the provisional on top of the restoration. See, it's not a hundred percent exact, but it's close enough that the holes are are where they need to be for the temporary cylinders, so that I don't have to fight with it. This gets cured removed and checked to make sure everything is stable, and then we repeat on the other side. So relatively quickly, we can go ahead and we can you know, finish this provisional restoration. While that's being finished off in the laboratory, multi-unit healing abutments are placed and the case is sutured, and the provisional restoration is inserted inside the patient's mouth. And you see we expanded the omaxillary arch slightly um, and started to correct the cross bite. Now we're about edge to edge. Two weeks later, the patient comes back and we see, well, our guess was not exactly right, right? The incisal plane is kind of is kind of off. Well, we need to correct that. We need to want to know, we need a model of exactly what we want our final restoration to look like. So we make those corrections, print a new provisional restoration, okay? Redesign the mandibular restoration because um, we're, we're not going to be bringing out the maxilla much more than where, where we had it before, but I actually could shrink down the, the mandible and the implant positions allow for that. So there's our healed maxillary tissue. There's the new maxillary provisional restoration and new mandibular provisional restoration, placing the patient into a normal class one relationship. Okay, now that uh, we can go back to, and the patient, uh, you know, has approved the, the aesthetics of the restoration, we're happy with the way everything appears. We convert it into a final restoration, which is monolithic zirconia on a titanium milled bar. And the case can be inserted and finished. And now we can plan to convert the mandible uh, in the same fashion, except all the work's done now. We can just go ahead and finish the mandibular restoration. 
So technology requires a new way of thinking and doing things, but results in enormous patient doctor benefits, such as time efficiency, reduction of the number of treatment appointments, reduction in treatment time during appointments, reduction in time between appointments, simplified and comprehensive data collection, simplified and comprehensive evaluation and diagnosis, easy multiple diagnostic try-ins, reduced laboratory costs, and a virtual technician in, in every office, every restorative office. But to gain the benefits of technology, we need to start thinking differently. It means understanding a little bit that we're dealing with data and the integration of data. And it will also require working a little differently than we're used to. So I'd like to thank you for spending your time. I apologize for going a little over on my time. Um, I think you're, you, I, I gave you a, a pretty good overview uh, of a digital ecosystem and the integration of different products. And you start to begin, it's important to understand that, that although things can be in an open architecture, right, it needs to be in a simplified and worked out fashion. And that's what we're presenting, uh, presenting here. And so we have no live questions today, but I'm giving you my email. I welcome any questions uh, or suggestions, you know, or comments. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting.